Anyway, I'm going to talk about global vision space of competing stimuli. Uh, this is work with Ricardo Ramos Gamero uh, and Peter Koenig in Osnabrück and Alessandro Lindy for, from um, Groningen. So to start with some motivation, um, well, so ultimately we want to understand human visual attention. I have this here. Of course, we have uh, more important questions for humankind, but uh, this is to say that um, we are here interested in understanding human visual attention. And there are so many approaches uh, to this question. One is one has been um, uh, computational models of visual saliency. And this has been very popular. And for example, recently, Matthias Kummer et al. Uh, proposed uh, deep gaze, which uh, com com uh, computes very accurately the, the distribution of fixations on natural images. So you get something like this. If we have another image, it would be something like this, like uh, an aliens map of a natural image. But here uh, we ask, so what if several images compete for our visual attention? And we, went, we question, okay, are some images as a whole more likely to attract human visual attention? And in other words, we are interested in finding out if some images have, uh, or if natural images have an intrinsic global visual salience. So an outline of, of the talk would be, um, and here I'm raising a spoiler alert because I'm going to tell you like the, the findings and I will try to uh, convince you through the presentation. Um, so first I will briefly talk about the data collection, which was an eye tracking experiment. Then I will uh, present the computational model where we compute the global salience of images and then straight away to the results. Uh, there are a few of them, but I'm going to uh, focus today on, on three of them in the interest of time. So um, about the data collection, we performed an eye tracking experiment where we had like 200 natural images from six different categories, uh, almost 49 um, participants. And we had 200 trial per subjects. And in some trials, we varied um, a small task the participants had to make. Um, we also mixed new with old images to get um, the variability to study this, these factors. And then we, we modeled the behavioral data from the participants with a computational model, a logistic regression model. And I don't have time to go into all the details. You can find this in the, in the paper. But essentially, the important bit is that we, have, we modeled this with a design matrix where each row um, uh, corresponds to a trial. And we have, this is like a vector where we have um, 200 entries in this vector, 200 numbers, which are because we have 200 images. And um, two of these elements in the, in the vector will be the image that is presented on the left and the image that, in, that is presented on the, on the right. And all other elements in the, in the row are zero and the left image will be one, the right image will be minus one. So in this case, we are giving our model uh, the information about that trial, which images were presented on the left and on the right. And we model this with logistic regression, and in particular, because we have pairwise comparisons, uh, the model simplifies and actually recommend a lot using this for pairwise comparisons because it's, it's, it's really handy. And we have here our design matrix and because we wanted to account for other factors like task, familiarity, and, and potential lateral biases, we added elements to the columns. And again, I will, I will, go, I will not go into the details, but we have uh, um, elements that accounted for the task, for the familiarity, and for the subject biases. So we trained this logistic regression model to predict uh, which image, uh, left or right, was fixated first. And the model actually performed uh, very well. This is good news. Um, so for example, it predicted which image was fixated first with about 82% accuracy, 81, 82% accuracy with a high error near the curve. And this is not the main results. This is just to tell us that the, the, the data, the behavioral data could be predicted and learned by, by a computational model, a machine learning model. And that means that we can use further the coefficients that the model learned. So now about the, the results, the main, the main um, result of our work or for this paper um, is, um, comes from looking at the coefficients of the images, uh, the coefficients of the model. And as I said before, there is one coefficient per image. So that this allow, allows us to, to rank, for example, the coefficients of the images. And we observed that uh, images that uh, contained uh, faces, like close-up faces or humans, um, Obtain the the higher the highest coefficients in the in the model, 
and after that uh, images with uh, of natural and urban landscapes uh, came this is another way of looking at, at this uh, as you can see in purple on top it's a uh, data points that correspond to faces, humans, and this get the, the highest coefficients. So we called these coefficients, this is what we describe as, as global salience, because this somehow models the likelihood of every image to, to be fixated first when it is presented next to, next to another stimuli. And we might be wondering, okay, this is cool, Alex, but uh, this might be just explained by, by the local salience properties of the, of the image. And, and we also wonder this, and we wanted to account for this. So is this a new, uh, an independent measure, or is something that uh, that could be explained by global salience? So we, we, to test this, we compared, uh, we computed the two the salience maps with two computational models. One is GBVS, uh, a good old GBVS, and the other one is DeepGaze two, more modern, more accurate. And we perform two types of analysis. One is to to check the predictivity of salience maps for for uh, yeah for predicting the location of the first fixation, and the other one is uh, to see if if these salience maps could predict um, uh, could correlate with the with the global salience scores. So here are the results. Uh, we computed the um, the KL divergence between the the fixations maps of. The, sorry, the first fixation maps and the and then salience maps of the computational models. And we observed, this is for GBVS, this is for a deep gaze, we observed that it's larger than zero. It would, if it was zero, it would mean that, that the first fixations corresponds to the um, high salience areas of the computational models, but that is not the case. So that means that uh, salience maps were not predictive for the location of the first fixations. This was one test, we performed other tests to, 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 to explain the, um, the, the relationship with um, local salience. So we, we looked at the correlation between the KL divergence, the scale divergence between first fixation maps and, and salience maps uh, with the global salience scores that we computed before with the logistic regression model. And again, we saw that uh, the correlation was either close to zero in the case of GBBS or Slightly, uh, slightly correlated in the case of, of, of deep case. And finally, we looked at trial by trial comparisons um, where we computed the salience map of the whole stimuli that the participants saw in the, in the lab. So the two images at the same time, and we computed the mass of each, of each side, the mass on the left and the mass, the mass on the right. And we again compared this with the global salience to see if it could explain our global salience scores. But it, Again, in this case, that was not the case, and this is telling us that um, local salience properties don't account for for our global salience scores computed uh, from learning the behavioral data of our tracking experiments. Finally, for today, uh, we looked at the lateral bias. So uh, it has this has been observed before that there is a tendency, at least uh, for people who uh, who learn to read from left to right, and there's there, there's this an open question. Um, we also observed in our in our data that people uh, participants um, looked more often first on the left image than on the right, and our model captured this. And also we could look at, at this on our data, and this is also an interesting observation because uh, it confirms uh, previous uh, results. Um, because we we introduced uh, coef um, coefficients in the in the cell in, in the um, computational model, we could also compare these coefficients with the percentage of fixations on the right image, and we observed that uh, the correlation was almost perfect, which means that the model was capturing this uh, well, and that means as well then then the the coefficients that we call global salience um, are more reliable. As a summary, um, we performed an eye tracking experiment with uh, competing visual stimuli, pairs of images, and we studied the effect of, of a task and familiarity, which I haven't presented today, but you're welcome to look at in the paper or just ask questions because I have some, some slides. And we also looked at the lateral bias. And we trained a machine learning model with the eye tracking data to obtain global salience scores. And we compare this salient scores with local salience properties of the images. And we found uh, that local salience properties don't account for the global salience of, 
of uh, natural images. And the main conclusion is that it is possible to measure the global salience of natural images that is independent of, of the local saliency and that there is strong spatial uh, bias towards the left side. And as a brief uh, comment about the results that I haven't presented, uh, we found that task and familiarity play little uh, role in, in, in explaining global salience and in this kind of behavioral data. And also that images with larger global saliency were explored uh, for a longer time. If you want to know more, we um, recently published this at the Journal of Vision. There's also a preprint and all the data and code is available on, on GitHub. And if you have questions, I'm very happy to, to take them. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Alex. This is very nice results. We have one question from our audience. Mohammed Abdelhaq is asking, does lateral bias correspond, correspond to conjecture, conjecture of the dominant eye? Mm, okay, that's a good question. Uh, I don't have the data to respond to this question at the moment, unfortunately. Um, I think I think it doesn't because um, just this, just from memory, uh, there was a, a majority of, of right-handed participants, and there is this uh, uh, bias to the to the left. And also, I can say that the, even if there is this strong lateral bias to the to the left image, there is a huge variability uh, across participants, and that's why we uh, modeled the the bias of each participant separately. Okay, thank you. We have another question for you from Tasvi Achlar asking, what about comparison between similarity between the two images? For example, similar to pop out, presumably if one has a unique features of over the other, this can pull attention to one. I'm not sure the local or global salience captures this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a good point as well. And this is something we are looking at um, as a follow up at the moment. Uh, so trying to look more closely at the particular properties of images. I could say that uh, local salience would capture would capture this uh, pretty well because uh, they respond uh, like uh, highly for, for this kind of pop-outs effects. And in general, what we saw with global salience is that because we are taking into account only the, the first saccade, uh, the first fixation, then uh, global salience would not... Um, uh, it, it, yeah, in principle, it would be more related to, to this sort of effects. That's why it was surprising that then we found that just images that contain humans or faces are the ones that receive the, the, um, the higher global saliency, meaning that they, they are fixated more often. So in some, it is not so much related to, to low level features of the images, but the social content, the semantics of the images, have uh, play um, a big role, meaning that in the periphery, before making the first arcade, we are able to scan the images and, and make this perceptual decision. Yeah, having a cute baby images might change <laughs> to quite a lot. Or cats. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, for Alex, for your nice talk. Now